Welcome to chapter 1.1 on cell theory, cell specialization, and cell replacement. We're going to start out by listing uh, the three principles or parts of the cell theory. And the first one is that all organisms are made of one or more cells. So we have things that are unicellular, like bacteria. Uh, we have things that are multicellular, like fungi, animals, plants, etc., but all living things are made out of at least one cell. And how did we figure that out? How do we know that? Well, this basically comes from the invention of the light microscope. So before the mid 1600s, we had no way of accurately seeing very small things. So if you're just looking at a human body, for example, you would never know that it's made of trillions of tiny, tiny units called cells. So really, if you're asked about supporting this idea from the cell theory, we should definitely be including the word microscope in our answer. The second part of the cell theory is that cells are the smallest units of life. Now, are there things inside of cells? Yeah, you betcha. We'll talk more about that in the next chapter. But these things on their own aren't living, okay? The smallest unit, okay, that can live independently is the cell. Cells are the smallest units of life. And scientists are actually still working on providing support for this area of the cell theory. Well, actually, that's not true. They're constantly working to disprove this. Okay, but as of yet, they've been unsuccessful. And by that, I mean that no one has yet found a living thing made less than one cell. Okay, they haven't been able to take any of these components of cells and make them live on their own. Okay, so those components can't survive independently. And that's how we know that cells are the smallest units of life. Perhaps one of the most interesting parts of the cell theory here is number three, all cells come from pre-existing cells. Now I know this sounds pretty self-explanatory, but people didn't always think this, okay? People once believed in a process called spontaneous generation, that living things just arose spontaneously came about from nowhere, okay? So maggots, for example, grow on dead flesh, okay, like meat. So people used to assume that meat grew maggots. Well, throughout a series of investigations, we've now realized that that is a silly way of thinking that the only living things, and since living things are made of cells, okay, uh, that can exist come from other living things. So new cells come from pre-existing cells. And Louis Pasteur was one of the scientists that really came about with this breakthrough. Okay, so he wanted to prove that bacteria didn't arise on their own, that they had to come from the environment. So he took two flasks of broth, like chicken soup, whatever, and he boiled both of them. The process of boiling killed anything that might have been there before. Okay, so basically by boiling, he's making sure that we're starting with chicken broth that is completely free of any kind of living bacteria. He took one with a long neck flask and he let it wait for a couple of weeks. Because of the neck of this flask, no air could get in here. So no interaction between the environment and the broth took place. And after weeks, okay, there was no bacterial growth. On another flask, okay, he broke the neck and then allowed the air from the environment okay, to interact with the broth. After a few weeks, he noticed that there were bacterial uh, colonies growing in that broth, proving that that bacteria had to come from the environment and couldn't come from the broth itself. So new cells only come from existing cells. Now, I made a super naughty mistake when I was making your notes guides and I forgot to uh, include this. So hopefully you can find some room at the bottom of your page to include this. But there are some notable exceptions to the cell theory. 
Okay, as with anything in biology, there are always exceptions. It's one of the things that makes biology so much more amazing, yet more annoying, than subjects like chemistry and physics, is because for every general pattern that we have, there are always exceptions. Okay, so we talked about cells uh, being the basic unit of life. Okay, well, we have some muscle cells called striated muscle cells. And um, they're very large, okay? They're hundreds of times longer. And each one of those cells contain many nuclei. So it's almost like having cells within a cell, which makes it difficult to tell if cells are the basic units of life, okay? Um, giant algae are another exception. Okay, these giant algae, uh, again, can grow very large, but they only have one cell, so they're not very small, okay? Uh, and the last one is what we call aseptate fungi. If you decide to get your septum pierced, okay, and I don't know why you would do that, but all the more power to you, okay, you're getting this middle part of your nose pierced. A septum is something that separates two chambers, okay? So a septate means a meaning not, okay, septate, some kind of separation. So we're talking about aseptite fungi as being fungal cells that do not have a separation, okay? So they kind of have distinct areas, but these areas aren't really divided into cells. Again, like the muscle cells, they contain many nuclei, okay? So they're not really divided into basic units like most other cellular things. So it's important to understand that there are a couple of minor exceptions to this cell theory. So we know that all living things are made of cells, but what exactly does it mean to be living? Well, there are some basic functions of living things that you should know, and you're going to need to know how to list these, okay? How to memorize all of these. I use a mnemonic device, M-R-S-G-R-E-N, Mrs. Gren, okay? To help me remember the characteristics of living things. It's important to understand that it doesn't matter whether it's a multicellular or unicellular organism, they all do these things. In multicellular organisms, uh, different types of cells probably work together to help maintain these characteristics. Unicellular organisms have to do all of these things within their one little cell. So it's a little bit different process, but the end result is the same. That all living things have a metabolism. They convert energy whether that's through photosynthesis or cellular respiration, all living things tear down molecules and then they rebuild them to make something else. All living things respond to their environment. Sometimes that can mean movement, but be careful, it doesn't always mean movement. It can mean releasing a chemical. It could mean um, tiny microscopic changes in cell shape, okay? But changes to the environment elicit some kind of a response. And that goes along with the next one, which is to have a stable internal environment or homeostasis. So this means that the inside of a body remains the same in many ways, regardless of what kind of crazy shenanigans are happening on the outside. So for example, I don't think you should have a baby until you can figure out how to keep it alive. So that means you got to know what to feed it, you got to know what to give it, and you got to know when it's sick. And we know that human beings are supposed to have an internal temperature of 98.6 degrees, okay, or scratch that because we're going to use the metric system, meaning that they have an internal body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. If it's hot outside, okay, our bodies need to find a way to cool things down to maintain this. If it's cold outside, our bodies need to find a way to raise our temperature, okay? But always coming back to this idea of having a stable temperature um, is one of those examples of homeostasis. There are lots of other ones too. It's not always just temperature. It could be water levels, salt levels, acidity levels, all kinds of things. Anywho, all living things grow. 
So if it's a unicellular organism, that cell is going to grow a little bit larger and develop more distinct features as it matures. If it is a multicellular organism, it's going to be adding on cells. All living things reproduce, whether it's sexually or asexually, doesn't matter, the ability to produce another organism okay, is a characteristic here. Excretion, so getting rid of waste, and nutrition, using materials and energy. So this brings about an important uh, point about viruses. We're going to talk a lot about viruses throughout the year. Um, and we often use words like, oh, we got to kill that virus. Okay, we've got to kill these germs. This is why the word germ is a very not so great way of talking about pathogens, things that make you sick, because germs could include bacteria, which are living, but the word germ can also refer to a virus, and viruses are not living. They don't carry out all of those functions of living things. For example, one of the things that they're not able to do is reproduce on their own. This virus, um, this is one of the herpes viruses, cannot make copies of itself. It cannot reproduce. Instead, what it does is it injects its DNA into a host cell, and it tricks that host cell into making new baby viruses for it. And then eventually that host cell becomes so full that it bursts and releases a bunch of new baby viruses. Okay, so because a virus can't reproduce on its own, they're not considered to be living. Now, you may be asked um, to observe or to explain how different cells um, kind of show these characteristics of living things that we've been talking about. Um, one of the cells that's really great for studying this is the paramecium. Paramecium is a unicellular organism, and it's from the kingdom Protista, so kind of like from all of our misfits that we can't classify anywhere else. If you have a dish of paramecium, okay, here they are here, a bunch of them, uh, and you add food to the dish, all of the paramecium will then come and cluster around these foods. So if I'm observing this and then I'm asked, what characteristics of life does this demonstrate? Well, I would say that they're demonstrating nutrition, okay, eating food. I would say that eventually they're going to have to excrete the waste from this food, okay? And I would say that they're also eating, so they're heterotrophs, this food, and converting that chemical energy. So there's your metabolism part. One of the other unicellular organisms that's really interesting to study uh, is something called chlorella. So chlorella are single-celled organisms that have a one large chloroplast inside. Chloroplasts are cellular organelles, cellular structure, that allow energy from the sun to be converted into chemical energy in the form of a carbohydrate. So in other words, we're talking photosynthesis. If I take chlorella and I store it in a dark place, it's no longer going to be able to undergo that process of photosynthesis. So again, a good uh, example of how organisms demonstrate a metabolism, okay, the ability to convert energy from one form, which would be solar energy, to another form, which would be ener chemical energy in the form of a carbohydrate. Okay, now speaking of cells, okay, in general, cells are really gosh darn small, okay? All cells are small. Some cells, however, are smaller than others, okay? So cells come in a variety of sizes, um, ranging all the way from really small bacterial cells um, to bigger human egg cells, okay? For the most part, cells need microscopes in order to be viewed, okay? That they're so small, we can't see them with the naked eye. The human egg is really kind of one of those exceptions. It's maybe about the size of a dot on a piece of paper. Um, but any other kind of cells are really, really small. So I'm gonna need microscopes to see them. In class, we're gonna be using light microscopes, and here's why, because they are cheap and easy, okay? 
So they're relatively inexpensive. That does not mean you can break them. I will have to hurt you and that will make me sad. Um, so they're just not so expensive that we can't afford any of them. Anywho, they're also easy to use. There's only a couple focus knobs on them and then you can pretty much see anything you want. I can see dead samples, so samples that have been prepared on slides, or I can look at living things. I can put maybe a drop of pond water under that microscope and see living things swimming around. They can magnify up to 2,000 times. So that's pretty awesome. We can see some small things. Here are some plant cells viewed under a light microscope, and I can see some pretty cool features. I can see the cell wall. I can see the nucleus. I can see the arrangement of cells. Okay, but even though we're ma uh, magnifying up to 2,000 times, there's a limit to the detail that I can see using these light microscopes. So thank goodness for these wonderful inventions called electron microscopes. They're really freaking cool. The reason we don't have one in class is because they're also really gosh darn expensive, okay? Um, they're actually very complex to use. So we can see one down here. There are a lot more moving parts. There are computers. I don't know. There's all kinds of things going on here. We also have to fix the specimens that we're going to look at in a special kind of plastic material. So they've got to be dead. The upside is that they can magnify up to 500,000 times. So here's a plant cell under a light microscope. Here's the same type of plant cell under an electron microscope. So now I'm able to view all of the different organelles and parts. So we're able to see a lot more detail. So you may wanna go ahead and add that into your notes that this allows us to see more detail. If you are looking at pictures like this, you are absolutely 100% positively looking through an electron microscope. So you'll oftentimes hear this referred to as an electron micrograph, okay? Electron from electron microscopes, it's produced using a beam of electrons and I'm not even gonna come close to explaining that to you. Micro, it's small, and then graph would mean picture or writing. So it's a picture that we're seeing through an electron microscope. Now, when we're looking through microscopes, it can be really deceiving um, because now all of a sudden really small things look pretty big. So I wanna make sure we're a-okay here on understanding the relative size of different things that we're going to be talking about. Okay, and I'm gonna be listing these from the smallest to the largest. I think I asked you to do the same in your notes, but just make sure. Okay, the smallest thing that we have on this list are molecules, okay? Molecules are small. So we're talking about several atoms put together, okay? So really very, very, very small. We cannot see these with microscopes. The next uh, biggest thing on our list here would be the thickness of a cell membrane. So I'm gonna be a little bit more specific when I list this. The thickness of a membrane so cells are lined with a membrane in the same way that uh, Reese's peanut butter cups are lined on the outside with chocolate. However, there's a really skinny membrane, okay, because it's only slightly bigger than molecules here. All right, next biggest on my list are viruses. Viruses come in different shapes and sizes, but for the most part, they're really small. Okay, next comes bacteria. Bacteria are very tiny. One of the reasons that they're tiny, and we're gonna talk more about this later, is because they don't have a lot of complex structures within the, uh, their cells to help them carry out basic functions. So they rely a lot on things like osmosis and diffusion, and for that you really have to remain small. All right, then next on this list would be organelles. Organelles are things like mitochondria, chloroplasts, Golgi bodies, endoplasmic reticulum, etc. Okay, so those are part of eukaryotic cells, things like animals, plants, etc. They are generally bigger 
than bacterial cells. So these are pretty tiny. If I'm also listing uh, what kind of cells are even bigger than organelles, okay, um, and you don't have to do this, but just an FYI, animal cells would come next, and then plant cells. Okay, plant cells are a little bigger than animal cells. Okay, but just based on this list, here's your list of them in order. All right, now when we're looking at cells under microscope, the whole point is to make them appear bigger than they are. But we need to keep in mind that there's a relationship between magnification, the actual size of an object, and how big it appears under that microscope. So we're gonna be using some of those parameters to calculate magnification or actual cell sizes. And it's important to review our metric units. And we're gonna be using three metric units. Okay, one of them is millimeters, little m, little m. One of them is micrometers, okay? And so I write micrometers like this, micrometers. You can also pronounce this micrometers, same thing. And that is the symbol mu, which looks like this, okay? Like a fancy M with a tail on it, and then meters. And then we've got nanometers, or NM, nanometers. Okay, now if I'm talking about one meter, okay, as the base here, there are a thousand millimeters in every meter, so I would multiply this number by this number. I would multiply, again, this number by a thousand to get however many millimeters I have, so that would be one millimeter, okay? There are a thousand micrometers in every millimeter, okay? So I would take millimeters and multiply a thousand to get micrometers, or if I'm going straight from meters, that would be meters times one and then six zeros, okay? Because there are a million micrometers, one followed by six zeros, a million micrometers in every meter. Now nanometers are smallest unit. Again, I'm going by a factor of a thousand to get from micrometers to nanometers. And that is because there is one billion, one followed by nine zeros, okay, nanometers in every meter. So a meter is about three feet, okay, just to give you a visual reference. And that means that there are one billion nanometers in that three foot section. So these things are really small. Now that we know uh, our metric prefixes, okay, let's talk about how we can calculate magnification. Let's say we know how big the actual size of an object is, and I know how big it is appearing in my microscope. I can use those things to find magnification. Okay, so magnification equals the size of the image divided by the actual size. So let's work on this example. I have an image that measures 60 millimeters. So the size of my image is 60 millimeters. So I'm gonna take 60 millimeters, okay? And I'm going to divide that, and I'm gonna put this on the bottom of a fraction, same thing as dividing, by the actual size, which is two micrometers. Now, the problem is here is that, uh, wait a minute, I can't divide 60 by two because these are in different units. Okay, so the easiest way to do that is to change one of those units to the other. Now, I know that there are a thousand micrometers in every millimeter. So I can quickly convert this bottom here by saying that there are 1,000 micrometers in every millimeter, okay? So why am I putting those on the top and the bottom? Well, I'm putting micrometers on the bottom because I want these units to cancel out, okay? 
So then to find what my new denominator is, I'm going to take 2 and I'm going to divide it by 1,000. And that gives me 0 0.002 millimeters. I'm left with millimeters here because that was on the top. And I didn't do anything to this original numerator, okay? So that is still 60 millimeters. Now my units are the same, so my units are going to cancel out. And to find my magnification, I'm going to write that up here, I just take 60 and divide by 0 0.002. And that gives me 30,000. Okay, there are no units on this, so you can either leave that at 30,000, you can say 30,000 x means times, or you can actually say 30,000 times and spell out the word times, it doesn't matter. Now we know that magnification, okay, is the size of the image divided by the actual size. But what if I know magnification and I know the size of the image, but what I actually want to find is the actual size? Well, algebraically, I can just switch this formula around, okay? So that would tell me that actual size equals the size of the image divided by the magnification. So in this case, I would have to know how big is the image and by how much has it been magnified. All right, so let's do that now. Okay, actual size equals the size of the image. Here this tells me, this example says, my image has been drawn as nine millimeters. Okay, and I'm gonna divide that, okay, dividing by the magnification. And the magnification is 5,000. Okay, there are no units on magnification, so I'm good to go as far as dividing nine by 5,000, and I get 0 0.0018, and then I still have my units here, millimeters. This, however, is not the right answer. Okay, you cannot leave answers uh, as this crazy small decimal. Your answers have to be somewhere between one and a thousand. That would be like me saying, oh, I'm 0 0.06 miles tall. That makes no sense. Don't say that. People will think you're dumb. Okay, we need to put these into correct units. Okay, so I'm thinking here, um, I need this number to get bigger. All right, so uh, that means my units are going to need to be smaller. Okay, the next unit smaller than millimeters would be micrometers or micrometers. So I'm going to put that on the top, micrometers, and I'm going to put the units I want to get rid of, millimeters, on the bottom. And I'm going to set up my ratio here. One millimeter is 1,000 micrometers. That means millimeters cancels out, and I can simply do... 0 0.0018 times 1,000, and that's going to give me 1.8, and then I have my units here, micrometers. And so now I'm good to go. I'm between 1 and 1,000. Okay, I have units that are appropriate. If I did this and I was finding that I was still at less than 1, I would then need to convert that to the next smallest unit which would be nanometers. So you just keep on going until you get an answer between one and a thousand. So 1.8 micrometers is really small and with very few exceptions, cells stay very small. And that's because their size is limited by a property we call the surface area to volume ratio. The volume, or the inside of the cell, is where most of the action is taking place. This is where all the chemical reactions of life occur. So converting energy and metabolism, producing and excreting waste, or actually I should just say producing waste, okay? All of those biochemical reactions are happening inside in the volume of the cell. But they are either requiring materials 
or they're producing waste that needs to be excreted. And all of that is gonna happen on the surface area, okay? So on the membrane or the outside of the cell. Okay, so we've gotta get this outside, the surface area, working to bring things in and out so that the inside of the cell okay, can undergo chemical reactions efficiently. Some of you have already done labs to demonstrate surface area to volume ratio. Some of those, uh, some of you will be doing those with me soon. Super fun. Um, and one of the things that we're going to find when we do that is that as cells get bigger, the surface area also gets bigger and the volume also gets bigger, but they don't get bigger at uh, an equal rate, okay? the volume grows much faster than the surface area. And so what happens then is my surface area to volume decreases as my cell gets bigger. So here's cell size, here's surface area to volume, and we can see that as cells get bigger, that surface area to volume ratio goes down. So it's not very efficient. Big cells have less surface area per unit of volume working to get things in and waste out. So if a cell can't get stuff in fast enough, that volume in there is wasted. It can't perform those biochemical reactions. So instead of cells just growing larger, okay, they divide. It's better to have many small cells than one big cell. So it's worth noting uh, how organisms get big. Again, their cells don't grow, they just have more of them, okay? So this person and this person have cells that are roughly the same size. It's just that this person has a lot more of them. Again, because large cells aren't very efficient at things like uh, diffusing materials in or excreting waste out because they have less surface area Per unit of volume on the inside. So because of that, most cells remain small, okay? Of course, because this is biology, okay, we have exceptions to those rules that you'll need to know. Um, there are some cells that just need to be big, okay, for, for certain reasons. Some of your nerve cells, for example, can be pretty large. You have a nerve cell that runs all the way from your lower back down to the tips of your toes. It can be up to three feet long. That is a huge cell, okay? So how is it still functioning? Well, because it's changed its shape, okay? Instead of being a cube, okay, or a sphere, it is now this long, skinny cell and it has created all of this area on the outside, all of this surface area for things to come in and out, okay? While the volume, what's on the inside, is remaining relatively small. So changing its shape to be long and thin is one way that cells can be large but still have an acceptable surface area to volume ratio. The other things that cells can do is create these infoldings, okay, in the cell membrane. So this is all one big cell here, um, but it has these tiny little folds in the outside, and what those folds do is they increase the amount of surface area, creates a lot more membrane space so that they can diffuse materials in and out more efficiently than if they were just a regular flap shape. So we know cells divide uh, when they get too big, right? Cells don't like to be big, they're not efficient, so they're gonna divide instead. But there are some other reasons for division, which is also called cell reproduction. And one of them is growth. Again, you start off life as a single cell, a combination of egg and sperm, and you grow throughout your lifetime. The only way that happens is through mitosis, or cell reproduction. So cells copy themselves when organisms are growing. It's like building a house out of Legos. To make the house bigger, the Legos blocks themselves don't get bigger, you just add more of them. The other reason might be to replace dead or damaged cells. When you hurt yourself, you're killing cells. The healthy cells next to those injuries are going to need to reproduce or copy themselves to replace those cells that you messed up. 
And of course, in single-celled organisms, um, they reproduce asexually, so they're just copying their cell, okay? And that is uh, another reason for cell reproduction. Now I wanna go back into this thought process of adding more cells for growth. So let's talk about humans, because we're the most interesting. Humans are made of a whole crap load of cells, a big number that you can never count to without messing up, trust me. Okay, yeah, all organisms, all multicellular organisms like humans start out as a single cell. Chromosomes from the sperm are injected into the egg and you form what's called a zygote. All of the cells in your body are uh, copies of that zygote. They originate from the zygote. So it is literally like taking one copy of something and taking it to a Xerox machine and making a bunch of copies, okay? Because of that, all of the cells in our body have identical DNA. That's why when you're watching horribly unrealistic shows like CSI, okay, it doesn't matter whether the perpetrator leaves skin cells, blood cells, sperm cells, hair cells, whatever, behind, okay? They can use those cells to extract DNA and match it to their suspect, okay? It's because all of the cells in your body have identical sets of DNA, and that's because they all came from this one cell, the zygote. When you are first conceived, okay, that zygote is going to start making copies and copies and copies and copies of itself, okay? At about the seventh day, after conception, you are made up of roughly 100 cells. Those 100 cells are all identical. They're all copies of the zygote. But at about the seventh day, that ball of undifferentiated cells implants into the mother's uterus and different cells start to become different organs, okay? They start to differentiate into several different types of cells. Let's take a look at how that happens. Okay, so cell differentiation is gonna work like this. First step, soon after conception, that cluster of identical cells is going to be exposed to hormones. Um, later on in the year, if you're in higher level, um, we're gonna be talking a lot about hormonal interactions um, that are involved with sexual reproduction and standard level kids, we get into that a little bit as well. And we're going to find out that hormones are some crazy chemicals that do some really wicked cool things. Okay, those hormones are going to reach different parts of that cluster of cells. So different parts are going to be exposed to different hormones. Those hormones cause the genes in those cells um, to start to do some weird things. It's basically going to turn some genes on, so those genes will be expressed, and it's going to cause other genes to be turned off, so not expressed. Having some of those genes turned on and others turned off causes cells to develop into different types. So from this ball of undifferentiated cells, okay, Different hormones act on different cells and they cause different genes to be expressed in different sections of that ball of cells, okay? So it's important to note that all of the cells in a single organism have identical sets of DNA, okay? It's just that some cells have genes that are turned on and others that are turned off. Okay, so let's talk about a skin cell and a liver cell. They obviously do very different things. They look different, they have different physiological functions, all kinds of things. Okay, how do they do that if they have the same DNA? Well, those hormones in the skin cells cause the skin genes to be turned on and the liver cells to be, or the liver genes to be turned off. Okay, so in skin cells, only the genes that are pertinent to being a skin cell are gonna be turned on. All of those other genes are gonna be turned off. In the liver cells, only the genes that pertain to li liver function are gonna be turned on, 
and all of the other ones are gonna be turned off. So every cell has a master set of DNA, but they only express the genes that are turned on so they end up all looking and functioning very differently. And just as an FYI, um, when these cells become specialized, so when a liver cell becomes a liver cell, okay, so an undifferentiated cell develops and differentiates into a specialized cell, okay, those genes are on and off forever, okay? This means that any cells produced by those cells will have the same on and off genes and they're gonna be the same type of cell. So a liver cell, when it goes to reproduce, is going to produce another liver cell because its genes are permanently on and off. Okay, so breast cells are always going to be breast cells. It's really interesting if you start to look at cancer. Okay, one of the things that we know about breast cancer and all types of cancers is that they can spread to multiple parts of the body. But they originated in the breast tissue. So if this breast cancer spreads to the brain, these breast cells can't turn their genes on and off and become brain cells. Those breast genes are permanently on and every other gene is off. So if these spread to the brain, what we actually see is breast cells in the brain, okay? Those are permanent changes. Once cells differentiate, they are permanently differentiated. And that process is going to lead to having a multitude of cell types in a uh, multicellular organism. So we have hundreds of cell types. All those different types of cells um, work together and we start to get something called emergent properties. Okay, if we think about a plane, planes have all these really cool parts to them, but all of those really cool parts are actually kind of useless until you put them all together. Having a jet engine is really dumb unless you also have jet wings, okay? Because the engine's not gonna go anywhere if it's not attached to wings. So when we say emergent properties, we mean that the sum of all of the parts, okay, is much greater in terms of function than all of the parts individually, okay? So that comes through interactions in the human body and other multicellular organisms organisms through the interaction uh, between specialized cells. So next time when your soccer coach tells you that you guys can accomplish more when you work together than you can individually, you can sound like a total nerd and say, well coach, these are emergent properties. You'll probably have to run laps for being a smart aleck, but you're going to be totally correct. Now, I keep talking about ball of cells, cells that are copies of the zygote, balls of 100 cells implanting in the uterus, blah, blah, blah. What I should be calling them are stem cells. Okay, stem cells, which most of you have heard of, are unspecialized cells that still have the ability to differentiate into specialized cells of any type. So here's a closer look at a very, very early embryo, like three days old, okay? So we have the zygote, which then copies itself multiple times until you get a ball of cells. These cells are not differentiated yet, okay? They are what we call pluripotent. They still have all of their genes uh, able to be turned on or off. They're not differentiated. They can become any type of cell. When most people say the word stem cells, their brain automatically reverts to this thought, okay, that they must be embryonic stem cells. There are other types, but let's talk about embryonic stem cells first. They, of course, come from the embryo, and they are undifferentiated. They can become any type of cell. Okay, so here's my ball of cells. They get exposed to hormones. Hormones cause genes to turn on or off, and then I get different types of cells. Adults also have some stem cells, OK? 
okay? But they are very limited. So these are cells found in certain adult tissues, not all of them, that can become a limited number of types of cells. So whereas embryonic cells can become any, these are only a limited number of cells. One of the examples of the adult stem cells are your bone marrow. So inside uh, your bones, your long bones, you have bone marrow, and bone marrow is made up of stem cells. These stem cells are adult stem cells. They can become white blood cells, red blood cells, or platelets. So they can become a few different types of cells, but these can't become stomach cells or brain cells or muscle cells. They can't do that. Okay, They're already partially differentiated. So maybe I should make a note here that these guys are partially differentiated. Okay. They can only become a few different types of cells. So what are we using these stem cells first? Well, I'm going to start off talking about embryonic stem cells because this is really where the most uh, significant uh, capacity for scientific research lies. And that's, again, because embryonic stem cells can become any type of cells. So let's say that I have some damaged cells either from an injury or a disease. I can take a ball of embryonic stem cells, expose them in a Petri dish to very particular hormones, and that causes those particular genes to be turned on and off and become a particular type of tissue. I could then use that tissue to replace the damaged tissue from my original patient. So for example, let's say a person's pancreas doesn't function properly they're going to have diabetes, pretty debilitating diabetes, okay? They have a couple options. Well, I guess one option would be they could die, which sounds kind of awful. Other option would be to use insulin for the rest of your life. Still, though, going to have um, some pretty significant health uh, complications. It would be kind of awesome if we could use these embryonic stem cells Okay, and to expose them to the hormones that make pancreatic tissue and then take that new pancreatic tissue and put it into my person with the damaged pancreas. It'd be really cool to be able to do that. I could eliminate a lot of health complications and uh, medicinal uh, problems. In terms of using adult stem cells, uh, this is done pretty regularly already, okay, uh, for a number of purposes. One of the examples here is with bone marrow. So remember, bone marrow can produce white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. More on those in another chapter. Well, let's say I'm a person with a blood cancer like leukemia, and those blood cells that are produced by my own stem cells are being very naughty, okay? What I can do is expose that person with leukemia uh, to radiation to kill all of their bone marrow, their bone uh, or blood stem cells. I can then harvest some of that bone marrow and those bone marrow stem cells out of a healthy person and put them into the person with cancer, those bone marrow stem cells can then live inside of the new person and produce new healthy red and white blood cells and platelets. One of the examples of specific stem cell treatment that you should um, definitely invest in learning is the treatment of something called Stargardt's disease. And Stargardt's disease pretty much just sucks. Okay. It results from inheriting two recessive genes from your parents, so good opportunity to blame everything on your parents. And this causes retinal cells, so the cells in the back of our eye that are responsible for light perception, to not be able to process vitamin A. Vitamin A is essential for proper light perception. So if these retinal cells are all funky and not processing vitamin A properly, what happens is that you get a dark spot in your vision. And this spot will grow and grow and grow until about in your 20s, it fully encompasses 
your vision and you're not able to see anymore. You have total blindness. Not too long ago, scientists began, uh, began using human embryonic stem cells uh, to make new retinal tissue. So how do they do that? They take undifferentiated embryonic stem cells and they expose them to certain hormones to make sure that they develop into retinal cells. They take those new awesome retinal cells and they use them to replace someone's old wonky retinal cells and it can completely restore their vision. So kind of a miracle cure for these people who would have otherwise lived out the whole rest of their lives in total blindness. So I've been rambling on and on and on about how stem cells are super cool. Let's kind of recap that, right? So potential benefits of stem cells, um, a reduction in human suffering, like those people that are blind by their 20s with star guards, okay? with irreparable uh, injuries or diseases, okay? We can cure those. We can replace those damaged tissues and cells, okay? Like I was talking about with the pancreas, we can reduce the need for medicines, which would be awesome. Less expensive, less side effects. We like those things, okay? I could also, and I didn't put this on here, and I should have, okay? We can reduce the need for organ transplants, Many people die waiting for organ transplants. Wouldn't it be great if we could just use human embryonic stem cells to grow them a new organ instead of waiting for them? I think that would be kind of awesome. But obviously we have to talk about the other side of the picture here. And there are some extremely uh, sensitive and legitimate ethical concerns here. Um, because again, we are using human embryos. If you have a ball of undifferentiated cells and you start to pluck some cells out of here, put them in Petri dishes and make them do what you want with them, the only way you're going to be able to do that is via the death of that embryo. That embryo is no longer going to have the potential to make a complete human life. We can make different tissues that we can then put into someone, but it will not be able to uh, develop into a human being. And so there are a lot of people that consider that to be taking a human life because we have something that has the potential to be life and we are denying that embryo uh, the potential to grow into a living thing. Um, so there are a lot of cultural and religious objections that go along with that. There's also a really interesting ethical consideration there because embryos don't have a voice. They don't have uh, any way of giving their consent to be used for that. I'd like to think that if someone wanted to test a drug on me, I would have to give them consent first. Like, yes, you can test this pill, but you're going to have to pay me $1,000. And then if anything bad happens to me, you got to help me out. Embryos aren't developed enough to give that consent. So definitely some things to think about there. And uh, we're going to continue on with this discussion of stem cells throughout the year because it's um, super interesting and relevant in a lot of future chapters.